Jonathan and for you for inviting me to give this uh, talk today. Um, I just wanted to explain a little bit first about the, the research that we've got ongoing at the moment um, here in Singapore um, with our HADR program and then that will hopefully better situate what it is that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, so the research program we started uh, last year uh, and we have four core research areas. Uh, the first being the future HADR or humanitarian landscape in Asia um, where we track the new humanitarian actors both state and non-state so whether it's faith-based organizations or new and emerging states responding to uh, disasters and conflict uh, and we looked at the particular successes also some of the challenges um, in preparing those responses within the region. Um, we're particularly looking at in that uh, research project uh, the relationships between the civilian and military actors and um, where they um, both have points of difference, convergence um, and also dispute. Uh, the second area we focus on is on community protection and assistance. Essentially this pillar looks at uh, vulnerability assessments of seven countries in Southeast Asia uh, including uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, Timor-Leste and uh, Papua New Guinea. The third area we look at is humanitarian effectiveness. So this is a bit more of an operational endeavor where we look at how those, uh, those different actors actually engage with one another in practice. So for example we uh, were participants in the ASEAN ERAP program a couple of weeks ago, myself and a colleague where uh, we were observing how the uh, emergency response and assessment team uh, were being trained there, um, how, what implications there are or potentials there are for engagement with other actors in the field. And the fourth area that we uh, cover in the program is humanitarian technology, um, which essentially looks at a broadly defined area both in terms of uh, online activities, so online humanitarianism or, or the online Jedis uh, as well as hardware. Um, there we're sort of looking at the use of drones um, and the impact that has, particularly the military uh, technology, what impact that has on humanitarian space. Um, with that we're looking at uh, hosting, or we are hosting a seminar next week with the uh, Red Cross, the ICRC, um, who will be uh, talking about their current project on updating and uh, writing the most recent commentary for, for the Geneva Conventions and the, uh, the impact that uh, technology has been having amongst other things in uh, recent legal developments uh, for the field. So thinking about uh, this particular topic, it's something that we've looked at um, consistently over the last year for myself it's been something that I've um, been very interested in uh, sort of throughout the last um, few years. Um, so what I'm going to uh, do today and please let me know if you're not seeing any of the slides as we, we go through them. Just briefly on there you can see there's a Twitter handle. Um, I do tweet now and again. I used to tweet a lot more. I don't do so much now. Um, but you know, feel free to have a look at some of the articles there. I do try and post on HADR and, and Myanmar in particular. Okay, so what I'm thinking um, about when we're looking at the civil military dynamics uh, in HADR are how we conceptualize it, but also how we apply these concepts. Um, what are the different approaches we have to uh, militaries and disaster management, how can we better understand the way in which uh, these uh, concepts are applied, how can we apply them differently, what are the um, influences on that and what does it tell us about the way in which we see the world and in this particular part uh, being the Asia Pacific and the, the humanitarian arena. Uh, then I'll, I'll briefly go through some of this I know you've already covered but it's still I guess important uh, to touch base with some of those regional actors and uh, practical examples um, before bringing it back to uh, 
there's uh, initial civil military relations in HADR and then what this means going forward um, as to are we seeing any particular new realities or are we just seeing uh, some old realities um, in new contexts. So first when we, we think about the concepts these may seem uh, basic but they also are very significant in how we understand uh, the actors within the field but also on what uh, they mean uh, in, in basic terms and there are, there are particular reasons why I've chosen these four primary concepts as both areas of convergence and, and divergence here when, we, when it comes to civil military relations uh, in HADR and allow me hopefully to explain the landscape primarily that we see in the Asia Pacific and tease out some of those tensions that we see uh, that we see here in this region. So this is the I guess the most the commonly understood definition of disaster coming from the IFRC um, in fact as far back as 2007 uh, being uh, the serious disruption you can read the, the entire um, definition there that they, they came out with um, but what we what it does include and what it does not include or rather excludes um, is particularly important here uh, and what we can see is that the the term of disaster by the IFRC does not and it rules out explicitly excluding armed conflict why is this important this is important because the uh, the nature in which the military actors will be engaging is uh, less controversial when we're looking at non-conflict situations however we have come to know and realize that there are those situations within this region in particular where we see complex emergencies or complex humanitarian emergencies where within this idea and understanding of disaster uh, there are pre-existing tensions internal wars uh, ethno nationalist conflicts and so on whether it is from the uh, KIA the Kachin Independence Army in northern Myanmar to issues over uh, political violence in Rakhine state against uh, Muslim minorities there particularly the Rohingya um, over then to the Philippines uh, in in the south where there is violence between the MILF uh, MNLF and a, a host of um, other Moro liberation organizations which are, are well currently in a peace process but uh, that certainly has been adding to some of the, the difficult situations there now why am I pointing out these complex complexities or these pre-existing tensions it's because in this region that whilst we know that 80% of what we experience when we think about uh, humanitarian assistance is in terms of uh, natural disaster or in response to the, the effects of natural hazards 20% uh, of that is still internal conflict and I think it's important to remember that because often that is is lost in the conversation uh, when we look at how states uh, and the, the landscape in the Asia Pacific um, has been evolving now I think one of the important things here um, in this region is that it is clear that military forces have become increasingly involved in what they term operations other than war uh, which includes the provision of relief and services to local populations affected by um, natural disaster but also in, in uh, situations of, of complex emergencies so what are the rules of the game in those sorts of contexts and that's essentially what we're going to try and flesh out here today um, at the same time though due to the changing nature of modern uh, complex emergencies we're seeing that the humanitarian community facing many operational challenges particularly because we see a rise in the number of non-state actors within the field who operate outside of the UN system which poses particular issues when it comes to coordination amongst civilian agencies um, not even going as far as the military ones at that point um, it is further complicated that we see when 
uh, military interventions involved as well for humanitarian purposes. And I'll spend a bit of time in that in approach later on um, with reference to what happened after Cyclone Nargis in, in Myanmar in 2008. And how this has led to essentially a real erosion of the separation between the human, uh, humanitarian and military space. Then we can add in another dynamic here, and that's the transition to, to development as being uh, three different constituencies which should, uh, in many cases, be working together. And as we heard from the World Humanitarian Summit earlier this year, that there needs to be greater coordination between the humanitarian and development sectors, but it remains to be seen. And then add to that those uh, military actors as well, which have particular benefits when it comes to uh, quick onset uh, risks. Um, it also raises a lot, I think, of concerns when we look at the application um, of humanitarian principles and policies, uh, as well as those operational issues. Now, indeed, we can look at it in terms of operational challenges, whether it is communication, coordination, coexistence, um, and those what those understandings are between them. But we also have to ask some more fundamental questions um, about one another's mandates, and what their capacities are, as well as their, their limitations, and whether they need to be looking at this on a more fundamental level. Now, some of you may or may not be aware of, of non-traditional security, and so I will spend a bit of time here talking about, about this and why, why it is important that we understand what essentially the concept of non-traditional security is. The main reason within this region is that it is a term that uh, generates much interest amongst the ASEAN member states uh, and uh, the dialogue partners, uh, which incorporates uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And as you can see here, there will be a lot of uh, commonality with some of the other concepts that we look at today in what areas it covers. Um, but importantly, we we see this at the, the regional level through the uh, ASEAN political security community, which is essentially the foreign minister's uh, engagement. So where did this idea of non-traditional security come from? And I think this will be very telling in how we understand the uh, landscape, but also the uh, way in which states respond to uh, these different uh, hazards or uh, man-made disasters within the region. And essentially this came out of what was an understanding in the, in the 70s, in the 1970s in Japan, um, but it had wider traction across Asia, particularly Southeast Asia, and that was the term comprehensive security. Um, and it was an attempt more to move beyond uh, Japan's wartime role and beyond national security being framed as only military based uh, and also to give a new and wider role for for security and how how policy was constructed. And there are there are reasons for that I will go into when we cover the approaches. Um, now this essentially came out in the, uh, 1978 where they uh, the Prime Minister at the time which was uh, Masayoshi Ohira from 73 to 1980, uh, where he understood it as being uh, a, a balance of national power, including various factors such as the economy, diplomacy, and politics, and so moving beyond security being solely one of, of wartime uh, territorial integrity um, and non interference in the other member states. And so what they did in this 1980s was a series of economists actually which came up with their, their new comprehensive national security strategy and they identified their seven objectives um, which included closer military ties with the US, uh, some other traditional ones as well such as their capacity to defend their own territory, improvement of relations with neighbours, but then attainment of energy security, achievement of food security and measures for coping with major earthquakes as being part and parcel of its national security strategy. Um, essentially, this was then uh, seen, the evolution was uh, seen in Southeast Asia uh, as well. Particularly, we saw it in, in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, 
and the Suharto in Indonesia and his uh, concept of national resilience. In Malaysia under Mahathir, his concept of national security and in Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew with total defence. Um, and essentially what we saw here was a way in which to understand uh, national security as being uh, being that more uh, than uh, interstate rivalry. Um, and I think there are a couple of similarities here which we can we can draw out uh, in its evolution over time. And the two essential components was the, the importance of, of stability of the country and then also the emphasis um, on economic development uh, as a tool for that stability. Uh, and essentially that essentially puts the, the government and the state right back at the centre as the primary unit of, of analysis. So when we're thinking about comprehensive security, whilst it's broadened what our, our general understanding of national security is, uh, it is also putting the, the state right in the centre of, of how we understand that. Now the differences that we've seen within, within Southeast Asia is that they tended to be non-aligned at the time, um, as well as uh, there was a sense of inclusiveness and instead the, the ASEAN member states at the time focused on norm building, uh, building trust and confidence and cooperative approaches with other regional states to address these non-traditional uh, threats to state, to state security. Um, and whether they be natural disasters um, uh, as they, they were understood then. It also became increasingly apparent that it was no longer just about the main uh, state actors that were getting involved, engaged in this conversation of how we understand uh, natural hazards or non-traditional threats to, to state security, but we were seeing the emergence of track two uh, security discourses. And essentially that was um, uh, the increasing use of CSCAP, which is the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, um, the ASEAN ISIS, which is a regional consortium of um, international uh, studies and security think tanks, uh, and how they then became influential in shaping this agenda to broaden, to continue broadening that idea of security to towards what we now know as, as non-traditional security. And this took over a number of years to do and um, going through uh, the, two, the, the late 1990s. However, when we got to the early 2000s, what we were seeing then was sort of this uh, elephant in the room of where was civil society engaged in this conversation. Um, and they, they were uh, largely absent from the, the main conversation, but there were were alternative approaches coming through um, outside of that, that main structure there. Um, and essentially what we have saw uh, during the, the 2000s was this emergence of, of non-traditional security which saw multiple actors really in uh, engaging in the security discourse and understanding security as being about states and societies or states and, and people, people's security. Um, we saw uh, on a parallel to this, uh, human security come through the UN in the uh, mid-1990s, 1994 report, UND report, uh, UNDP report um, as well, where they have those particular um, seven components of, of human security. And non-traditional security really differs um, in, the, in this region. It was a combination of both that state level security and the the human or individual level uh, security, which is where the, the broader term of non-traditional security came from as a way to um, bring those different understandings of security together. So it did focus on, on the more development agenda that we saw through human security, whether it was access to food and so on uh, during times of crisis, um, but also some of those uh, larger considerations of of the state. So essentially that's where this conversation of non-traditional security came from in understanding um, humanitarian assistance and, and disaster relief during this and as a result of the uh, organization NTS Asia Consortium uh, we saw this definition come about which as you can see from the others that we've been looking at they are a lot in common. 
Now, one of the, the bigger questions I think that we have in the region is over the use and application of the, the humanitarian principles. Um, and the reason why we talk about this is because when we think about the, the next concept of that being of, of relief, there are, there are some tensions here, right? So we do have all these uh, fundamental humanitarian principles, which I'm sure you're familiar with, of humanita uh, humanity, impartiality, uh, neutrality, and independence. Uh, but within this region, what we've seen, because the uh, majority of the focus has been on uh, natural disaster and response to uh, natural disaster, uh, there has been less controversy around uh, military engagement because they have tended to be framed, at least, if not actually part of, um, not being part of a uh, an ongoing conflict, uh, which has led to it being seen as less controversial in practice, um, which does uh, beg some questions, which we will ask later on about the, the principles versus the practice of uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, and the, the final one I really want to just touch on here is um, the use of, of relief. And indeed in the title of the program that I'm uh, involved with here in, in Singapore, it includes disaster relief. So how is there a difference between humanitarian assistance and, and relief operations? And I've just pulled out here something from uh, the uh, 2004 report, reference report for civil military relations. And here, essentially, we can see that relief is, are, uh, is assistance by people who uh, cannot uphold the uh, humanitarian principles. Um, and as you can see there, it was, it's been recognized by, by many parties for, for quite some time. So when we're understanding these different concepts, it is, they are used, used for a reason. So I think there, there are important differences here that we need to uh, investigate further over the next approximately 30 uh, or so minutes. And so what is the nature of of these uh, militaries getting engaged in the disaster management cycle, and I thought this was probably the uh, best way to look at how they would be um, present in in those different uh, parts of the cycle here. So when we look at uh, responding uh, in the emergency phase, we can see militaries do get involved because of their um, ability to have surge capacity or their ability to respond quickly. Um, they in, are involved in search and rescue, uh, firefighting, emergency medical support, evacuations, uh, logistical support, going the C-130s uh, into Kathmandu, for example, uh, um, to deliver assistance, um, or try to, in the, in the case of Kathmandu. Um, air traffic uh, management, uh, communications, we're establishing uh, mobile phone masks and utilities putting uh, water and power back on line. Then as we move into recovery phase, we essentially see uh, their engagement less and less because they are they don't particularly want to necessarily be involved in, in recovery efforts, but they're already there in the response, so usually they have an exit strategy, um, but they can have uh, an impact and they have had well, certainly in the recovery effort in further afield in, in Afghanistan, for example, where we see engagement in heavy construction. Uh, or certainly uh, also within this region, their transition to, to recovery and handing over, um, whether it be hospitals, uh, for example, to, um, to development actors or other humanitarian civilian agencies. Then, uh, risk reduction, essentially what we're seeing there are those ongoing knock-on uh, effects. But particularly we see the most activity other than in response in, in preparedness. And this is where I think most of the experience and learning will come from when we think about civil military relations. And that's uh, through uh, training exercises, um, training programs, uh, early warning systems or ongoing warning systems i.e. the sharing of information, and then we see in 
in stockpiles because who's storing it? Where is it? Where is it uh, going? Is it pre-positioned? Um, and how's it going to get there? So there are there are several areas that we see um, military engaged in, but essentially we're seeing it mostly in, in preparedness and response. The others are, are are much less, and there's good reason for that as well. Um, so when we think about the types of humanitarian assistance, we're really looking at uh, aid delivery um, and the fact that many countries have affected sta or affected states uh, in response to uh, natural disasters don't have uh, airlift or sea lift capabilities, so they're going to be um, reliant on those people overseas. When we're looking at um, a provision, we're looking at uh, medical personnel and, as I mentioned, the search and rescue personnel uh, engaged in those areas. Now, what I've just put in here is to introduce the uh, schema that we see from C, E, D, M, and H, A in Hawaii. Um, and that's essentially I've, I've adapted from that. And what I've adapted actually here is if you focus on, let me see if I can get the uh, pen working, is this area here. Is that working? No. Um, which is the uh, RHCC, which is a new actor within the region. The, and that is the uh, Regional HADR Command and Control Center uh, based here in Singapore at Changi Naval Base. Um, and what their interaction is with uh, AHA Center is something that is, is of interest and is ongoing. AHA Center, um, as many of you will know, is the ASEAN uh, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster uh, Management Coordination Center. I've probably got those uh, uh, around the wrong way, but that's um, roughly what it, it stands for. So they, they're the civilian Led agency Hello. for coordination. Yes. Hi, can you use a different color uh, to highlight these? Because black and dark oh. background, it doesn't go very well. Sure. sure, let me have a look how the. Uh, you can go to the color palette and you can choose probably orange or yellow or green. Sure, okay, okay. let me just try and figure that out. Let me. Thank you, yeah. A lot of major things. Thanks. Ah, that, okay, I see it now. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Is that clear? Okay, I'm going to continue. Hopefully that's clearer for you. Um, there. So those are the two. Um, important actors, I think, which are particular to uh, the Asia-Pacific region. Um, but if you uh, take note of, of this slide, we will come back to uh, explaining it later. The, I think the important parts here, um, if we look at the top of the um, slide, we see the assisting states, and those are essentially bilateral relations um, that with the affected state, which is in the, the center of the diagram. Uh, and then on the right hand side we have the international community which is essentially the UN led uh, community structure through the UN cluster system. Um, and alongside here you'll see a, a small note on, on NGOs over here. Um, however, as we know, they do not always operate within the system and oftentimes particularly smaller NGOs fall outside the system which poses particular challenges when uh, trying to coordinate uh, assistance. Okay, so what I would like to do at this point is to um, move into those different areas of um, of understanding. Um, well, sorry. Uh, into understanding these. Uh, uh, in the way we approach these different um, 
strands of this this slide here. So uh, what I mean by that is the um, the approaches in general when we try to analyze the situation of um, a humanitarian emergency, whether it's complex or whether it is um, uh, in terms of uh, response to uh, an earthquake or uh, a typhoon. And as I mentioned before, there are three ways in which we see um, as the, the most common approaches. And the first one, uh, which we'll all be, uh, I think, most familiar with in the humanitarian community is the UN-driven approach here, also known as the, the multi-dimensional approach uh, here, which focuses on the UN essentially as the uh, main framework and driver of of humanitarianism, um, and in, in, involved in that, of course, is um, the um, other relevant international uh, stakeholders, whether it is the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, uh, and so on. But it, it is essentially an approach that sees a framework where uh, the UN is front and centre to manage. Uh, the relief distribution uh, and essentially collection of aid by um, by donors and then the distribution of that in, in times of need. Now, whilst this situation was uh, certainly closest to working during the 1990s, um, there was a very quick fall off um, from it. We saw as uh, we passed into the 2000s, um, and we did go through a period of reform in the mid-2000s and the 2005. Um, but essentially, this has been an ongoing issue and challenge to the system because there are increasingly uh, larger numbers now, and it is approximately 50% of actors in the field fall outside the UN system. And the remaining 50% is split between uh, the Red Cross movement and, and the UN agencies and then those that they, they partner with. So there is a big shift away from um, from this UN system. But at the moment, uh, the World Humanitarian Summit, as we saw earlier this year, uh, did not have any golden bullet. Um, but that remains to be a, a conversation that continues to be ongoing in how to engage with those people who are not part of uh, the system or how the system can adapt um, to include those different players. Uh, and within the UN system, one of the controversies that we've seen uh, emerge uh, was in the aftermath of uh, Cyclone Nargis in 2008, when Bernard Kuchner uh, was arguing that the international community had a responsibility to protect victims of Cyclone Nargis. Now, this was essentially a shift away from what had been agreed at the 2005 World Summit. Um, where the responsibility of protect was solely focused on on genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing, uh, to saying that um, states which do not provide for their own populations during periods um, of natural disaster uh, should be held accountable by the international community. And um, firstly, through them being offered assistance, and if those states then uh, refuse that assistance. Uh, then the international community should use the appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful means to protect those populations. Um, but if they still fail through the use of all those other means to protect those uh, people affected by uh, cyclone Argus in this case, uh, then the international community must be prepared to take stronger measures, including the collective use of force through the UN Security Council. Uh, and what we saw in 2008 was a shift in the, the thinking of RTP, but also in, in what was happening. Essentially, the uh, military junta at the time were not willing to allow uh, foreign assistance in, uh, and there was a complete uh, blockage going in. We knew the extent of the damage that had been caused in the uh, Aowadi Delta, um, and there was little that uh, people could do at the uh, the international community could do at that time. So what we saw emerge was a very important, um, and it's continued to develop since then, uh, mechanism, which was the tripartite core group, um, which essentially saw the ASEAN Secretary General at the time, Surin Pitsuan, uh, shuttle diplomacy, 
uh, between uh, the uh, government in Myanmar uh, and the UN uh, to find a way to broker essentially access to those populations of concern. Now, whilst this was uh, needed at the time and there was a way that was through diplomatic measures that uh, it was achieved and access to those populations and aid and assistance was eventually getting through, it certainly set off um, a number of alarm bells for many governments in the region. If the uh, shift had been uh, quite so strong from the international community towards R2P plus is what it's generally referred to as having the international community forcibly uh, move to distribute humanitarian assistance in countries which did not uh, want or want to receive it. And this uh, really has caused and shaped uh, a lot of discussion in this region as to what, uh, to what extent can uh, the principles of humanitarianism be upheld, but also what the role in uh, the humanitarian system in the aftermath of a disaster is it for, for states, um, both in terms of the affected state and those willing to assist uh, either in terms of um, diplomatic means, but also potentially with those uh, more significant military means. Um, so this uh, brings us to sort of the second general approach that we see when we're looking at analysing these situations, uh, and that is the state-driven approach here. And essentially what we're seeing with uh, the state-driven approach is um, the bilateral relations, and this is where we really tease out um, some of those military engagements, because as we've seen in the region, it has generally not been... Um, uh, the, lar the largest amount of, uh, within natural disasters has been coming in the emergency phase from militaries, and um, both in terms of the affected states, uh, in terms of their civil defence capacity as it's constructed in some states, but also in terms of their, their militaries, and then their militaries pre-existing uh, arrangements with, with other militaries. And I think this was most notable when we saw uh, the response to super Typhoon Haiyan um, through the, the US um, engagement there um, because of their, their pre-existing military arrangements as well as um, Australia and Japan uh, to name a few um, who were engaged there. Now so the, uh, I think the point here is when we're looking at this, this tends to uh, look, focus more on the actions of the uh, affected government um, here and how they interact with some of those other governments um, internationally. And what we'll see between these, nothing is clear cut or you're not able to, to cookie cutter these different approaches, they all essentially interact uh, within the international system. But looking at the way the, the states try to drive this is a way to uh, see the uh, sovereignty norm being re established, uh, or not re-established, but upheld, if you will, um, and that the territorial integrity must be respected. So there's no free pass uh, without the, the say-so of states. And then what we can see from that is the uh, national capacity of those affected states uh, and their ability to respond to those disasters in, in practice, um, whether they are being uh, overwhelmed completely or incapacitated by it. Now, one of the important things, I think, when we're looking at this level of analysis, so when we're looking at the state level, uh, what we can see is that context matters. And in this region, in the last five years, no state has asked for uh, humanitarian assistance in the aftermath of a disaster. However, they have uh, willingly accepted offers of humanitarian assistance. Uh, and while that sounds like a, a play on words, what uh, is important here, and this also came out in, in Super Typhoon Haiyan, was the importance of face um, with national governments in responding to uh, disasters. And what we saw uh, in the, the case of Haiyan was that the UN responded saying that the government was um, 
at the highest level, so it was completely incapacitated. Um, but uh, regional states uh, recognizing the sensitivity of, of saying that they were essentially failing, uh, they offered assistance to the Philippines in which they accepted. Uh, so it, it, again, it, it's about the construction of the, the, the context in which these uh, negotiations take place, but they can also matter very much in how the way states respond and even the international community respond to these um, are very important, particularly when we're looking at um, uh, the crisis period. Now, the, the third area, and this is where it overlaps with uh, many of what um, uh, what is going on within the field, and it is uh, non-traditional approaches. Uh, and whether you're, you're familiar with the terms of constructivism, as in the, the way in which we look at these relationships, is we need to deconstruct them to understand why is it that a uh, particular relationship works well, whether we're looking in this context of between civilian and military agencies, has there been a history, who are they, do they are they coming from the same team? Uh, and essentially, when we're looking at this, this is how we can begin to explain some of those um, broader shifts in how how states are responding uh, to to natural disasters. And one of those uh, approaches can be seen as being a whole of government or whole of society approach, in which the the use of the assets of the military are used by uh, a civilian government agency, usually an international development uh, agency. Of a, of a particular government or uh, or the State Department, for example, in, in the US or USAID uh, and so on, uh, where they, they draw on those, but they have uh, clear, clearer lines of communication cooperation within within that national response over who does what, uh, when and how. Uh, and it's really about looking at those kind of approaches to see how we can understand and how we can better move this conversation forward, um, but also how to break it down where they're, when they are, when they are failing, uh, to try and understand better what are some of those those pushes. And this obviously goes further afield than just the respondents. Uh, it goes into understanding what those uh, state structures, uh, what those local societal actors are, whether they be in the public, private, or or what we call in, in within ASEAN people sectors, but that being the civil society sector. Um, so we really, uh, the, the purpose of the non-traditional approach is to, to break down um, some of those essentially power relations and prevailing social structures and institutions. Um, and the difficulty here when it comes to understanding uh, humanitarianism in general is that uh, it essentially argues, or the multiple different approaches uh, argue that there is no such thing as neutrality. And this is a, certainly a, uh, a more fundamental question we have to ask when thinking about humanitarian assistance is the, is the ability to be, uh, to be neutral uh, in the context of disasters. So if that is the case, then what is the difficulty with engaging with militaries in the aftermath of a disaster? So when we're looking at uh, military assistance in, in the Asia Pacific, uh, we tend to, well, we know internationally it is uh, understood to be a method of last resort. Um, however, within the Asia Pacific, it's usually um, one of the first responders to, uh, to disasters. Uh, and there, there are reasons for that. There are, are uh, low capacity state structures in place. Um, they are also the ones who have a, a strong command and control structure, uh, so they're able to function under particular pressure, whereas perhaps the, and they have access to uh, substanti substantial assets uh, and uh, over the longer term, whereas civilian agencies might not have access to some of the uh, aircraft, or they might not have access to um, the kinds of training that militaries have generally been exposed to. Um, so it allows them to be uh, highly functional in the aftermath of a disaster and, and have that surge capacity. So when we're looking at the application of this within the region, who are we seeing 
um, emerge as some of those key players? Well, from since about 1998, well, well since 1998, where we see that, that Japan sent the SCDF, the SDF, sorry, Self Defense Forces to Honduras, um, we've seen a couple more of the Northeast Asian uh, countries uh, respond to uh, disasters, being uh, Republic of Korea, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and China responding over 37 times up to about mid uh, 2014. Uh, and there's the article in the readings um, by Jeff Engstrom um, at RAND who has thoroughly documented this through looking at the uh, white papers of the militaries involved in Northeast Asia to see who it is they've been um, uh, responding to and in what context that is. So I, I encourage you to, to look at that uh, article if you've not done so already. Um, and then at the bottom there, I think it's important to recognize, of course, when we're thinking about the Asia Pacific, it's not obviously just uh, Northeast Asia, but also there are key responders when we're looking beyond that uh, that uh, sub-region of the Asia Pacific, being US, Australia, New Zealand, also ASEAN member states are increasingly key players in this uh, realm. We're seeing Singapore play an active role in the uh, Nepal response. We also saw uh, significant roles by uh, other ASEAN member states, including most notably Indonesia, um, where, which is home to uh, the AHA Centre. Now, one of the uh, more significant examples, um, again, I encourage you to go uh, and engage with this as a case study, is to look at the development of the Pacific Partnership, which is uh, a US initiative. Um, which has been going since 2004. And much of the activity that we see between militaries in Southeast Asia um, has been uh, since 2004. There was, a, of course, a spike after uh, the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, and the US since then has held uh, an annual deployment um, in which it engages with different countries in the region. Now, it has done primarily so with its allies. In the last year, we have seen them engage with Vietnam. Um, as a significant uh, development in that. And when we're looking at the, the US role um, within the region and certainly their uh, pivot uh, to the Pacific, this is one of the ways in which we see their, their soft power engaging with states in the region. Um, but there are some operational lessons as well which has been uh, taken, uh, which can be taken away. And that's that, that uh, the last one, no matter you know, how much you plan, uh, the challenge will always be when you're rolling it out. Um, so you can have all these uh, exercises and the, and the partnership, but, you know, obviously the, uh, the the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, in that once it happens, then it doesn't always run the way it did in, uh, in the exercise. So what are some of these key challenges that we're seeing between the civilian and military uh, actors in HADR. As I've mentioned already, that we're seeing there are more and different humanitarian responders, whether it's in terms of uh, non-state actors being faith-based organizations, diaspora are increasingly playing an important role, um, but can also play um, a role in terms of engaging with uh, non-state armed groups or with uh, traditional uh, state institutions as well in the region. Um, we're also seeing this lack of real clarity uh, in complex humanitarian emergencies or relations between civilian and military agencies. Um, and when we, we think about the level, when we're looking at it from an operational level, there might be ways in which actors engage. But when we take a step back and look at how far this has actually progressed, it can be actually quite surprising how little has been really been achieved. Um, but where it has, there are areas where there has been some progress, and that will be around those confidence building measures um, at very basic operational levels, um, but not very much in terms of, of real strategy or awareness of what the mandates are of one another. Uh, in the humanitarian space, and this is particularly an issue when we're looking at, uh, at civil-military relations because oftentimes militaries are used to their uh, 
the uh, command and control structure, command and control structure. But when it goes to civilian agencies and particularly NGOs or even smaller NGOs, um, those lines of communication are not clear, they're not well established, um, and they're certainly ad hoc and last minute during those periods of crisis. They're not um, during periods uh, outside of crisis, um, which is where the use of those preparedness mechanisms, whether it is training or uh, exercises and so on. And when we're thinking about that within the region, uh, we're seeing the movement towards military becoming engaged with the ASEAN AWAC training potentially next year, um, which is on the cards. Um, now, what, one of the important quotes I thought uh, that I've heard fairly recently was that whilst the, and this is a military person talking here, we're not on the same team, but where there is overlap, it's finding when, where and how. So that's exactly the, the issues that we're seeing between those two actors is that they don't even know where, they're in, where one another are, are actually uh, in the field when it comes to a crisis situation. In the case of Nepal, we saw even other militaries don't know where other militaries are because they, they don't want to share information. So we haven't even uh, got as far as to say, well, there's good coordination across militaries. Um, but it does boil down to having those mechanisms in place where there is a way to uh, to share some very basic information between civilian and military actors in, in the humanitarian space. Um, in order to avoid this, either you, you, you are going to be faced with the scenario of either you're going to cooperate or you're going to compete with those organisations. And we know that inefficient humanitarian assistance is where you have have uh, five actors in one village delivering too much assistance and the, one of the villages which is a bit further away, a little, little more remote, um, is not getting anything. So we're seeing duplication in, in one, one area and then a complete uh, under um, distribution of resources where it's needed as well. And so here there are just a couple of, of um, of notes um, before I close here on on what some of those observations are that I've mentioned. Um, also, I think I'll, I'll, I'll mention here is that we see lessons observed. Pretty much every NGO uh, or civilian and military organisation goes through debriefings after they've been in the field. Um, and the, the point there about lessons being observed rather than learned is that they're they're being repeated time and again. It's it's no different to the last time, essentially, as there's very little ability for those to either be absorbed through turnover of staff or whether it is uh, through um, the need to move on to to the next crisis. Um, so those are, are some of those challenges. So when we're going forward, um, are we seeing some of the the same old realities or are there really, really new ones? Um, and these are, are issues I've mentioned here. One thing I didn't really have a chance to talk about was the role of, of ICT. And I think here um, there are, are a lot of activities going on at the moment with the online humanitarian community, um, which are, are very influential in, in crisis mapping and um, through um, through the use of uh, online social media, for example, which was seen as being very successful and influential uh, in the aftermath of Haiyan. Um, and that has some real potential to um, change the way we understand uh, needs-based assessment, but also um, it will raise undoubtedly some, some questions as well um, over uh, how much influence it has on, on that. And we all know it's a a support to um, an overall assessment, um, but undoubtedly we will see some some new challenges, perhaps uh, ones which are, are repeats of old ones. Um, and I think with that, uh, I'll, I can open up to some some questions if anyone has any. Thanks very much. <laughs>